Good afternoon, everyone, and on behalf of my colleagues, welcome to the Health Climate Officer Lecture on Sustainable American Relations. Before we begin, let me say a few words about the lecture series, after which my colleagues will introduce our distinguished guests and our speakers who see the The lecture series is meant to honor Philip Barnett and my top speakers and their contributions to Sustainable American Relations. Don't be like the two American scholars and policymakers of the state, whose writings and actions had a powerful impact on bilateral relations dating back to the 1960s. Doug Barnett was born and raised in Shanghai, actually just a few blocks away from where I'm sitting today. Uh, his father worked for the YMCA, which is why he was here. Doug went on to teach at Columbia University and Johns Hopkins University where an entire generation of American China scholars were influenced by his writing and teaching. During the 1960s, Dope was an early and respected voice calling for a dialogue and relationship with China, despite the deep differences between the two countries at that time. His testimonies to Congress, his behind-the-scenes efforts, and his counsel to people such as President Johnson, and, and this is now me speaking personally, not Paul, I would also say his involvement in many of the institutions that started the, at least on the American side, thinking differently about U.S.-China relations, his involvement with the Committee on Scholarly Communications with the People's Republic of China, and is one of the founding members of my organization, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Uh, he was both our founder and our second chairman. So all of those things that Paul had mentioned and then his involvement in those institutions are really what helped to begin the process of a change in attitude and policy toward China in the United States. So his influence on policy was really enormous. Mike Oxenberg was an outstanding student of Dope Barnett's, and while at, that's when he was at Columbia, and went on to a distinguished teaching career at the University of Michigan. Mike also raised the next generation of American scholars and students who tried to understand China as he had learned from Doak, so his students learned from him. Mike eventually served in the National Security Council of President Carter's administration. And at the ninth Barnett Oxenberg lecture given by President Carter here in Shanghai back in 2014, President Carter underlined the critical role that Mike Oxenberg played in the normalization of relations between our two countries. Both Doak and Mike were scholars of distinction who, traveled, who straddled both academia and policy making. They both had a great admiration for China's cultural, history, and traditional values, yet advocated hard headed and realistic policy making. They both took the long-term view on the incredible possibilities of harmonious relations between our two countries. And they both, I suspect, would find it perfectly normal that deeper and broader engagement would lead to tensions and disagreements, such as we're having now. Like some of you here, I had the privilege of studying under both Dope and Mike. Although both have passed away, we continue to honor them. And by honoring them, we also honor the many people in both countries who continue to strengthen the foundations of the relationship between the United States and China. The lecture format is structured to be a dialogue, which includes your involvement as an audience, who are here by invitation. An American's lecture is commented on by a Chinese commentator, and then the audience is free to ask questions in an open forum. And we really hope all of you will ask questions today. There is a saying, may you live in interesting times. That is especially true for today, and indeed this past week. And in these times, dialogue and communication are even more important. We hope that this year's dialogue will be lively and engaging. We would like to thank our sponsors, whose generosity made this event possible. The two sponsors this year are Marriott and Microsoft, two great American companies. And then Paul was going to, no, I'm sorry. There's another one. Sorry about that. Uh, we also want to thank, in particular, the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. I can't leave that out because they are very wonderful and very integral to 
the working of this event. Uh, and it's very able and capable events team that does incredible work in doing all the logistics for today's event and for all past 11 events that we've held and for their continued critical support. Finally, included in our audience are at least 25 to 50 Chinese and American graduate students whose specialty is Chinese-American relations. They hail from the top universities in Shanghai and also from the Nanjing Hopkins Center, where American and Chinese students live and study together, considering the thorny issues and possibilities of our complex relationship. And I should say that had it been for Doe Carnet, the Nanjing Hopkins Center probably would not have made it past the drawing board. He was very, very influential in helping that organization become established. These young people are part of the future of our relationship, as are all of you. Thank you all for your continued engagement and for being responsible stakeholders in the future of Sino-American relations. So thank you all. So, when Paul emailed me, first of all, let me introduce myself a little more fully. I'm Jan Barris. I'm the Vice President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. And it's really been a pleasure for me to be involved in this Garnett Oxenberg program from the very beginning. Um, Paul, when he emailed these remarks, he mentioned in his cover notes, uh, he said, you don't need to mention me, it's okay. Don't waste the time talking about me. But how can I not? Because if it weren't for Paul, we would not be sitting here in this room. Uh, and we would have had the 11 wonderful preceding lectures that have taken place before this. Those of you who've been to a Barnett Oxenberg lecture before have heard me tell this story. And I, at the risk of boring those of you who heard it and embarrassing Paul, I do need to give you sort of the genesis, which is that in a very filial Chinese way. Paul was a student, as, as he said, of both uh, Mike's at the University of Michigan and then Paul uh, Dokes in Ann Arbor, sorry, at Sites in Washington. Uh, he spent a two-month interval between those two schools at the National Committee on the China Relationship as an intern. So when Paul graduated and he and his wife Grace, who's in the audience, came first to Hong Kong and then to Shanghai, he felt he wanted to give back something to his teachers, the men who had been very important in shaping his life. And so he called me and said, because he knew how important both Doak and Mike were to the National Committee, he said, would you help me uh, and the wonderful Ding Xing Kao, who is also sitting in the front row here, who was then head of the Shanghai Association of American Scholars, would you help us next time you're in Shanghai think of a way that we can honor both Dope and Mike? And from a dinner that the three of us had about 14 or so years ago, we came up with this lecture series. And we, um, we are grateful. We at the National Committee were very happy to do it, especially since Paul offered to raise all the funds for it, because that made it easier for me to be able to go to my boss and say, we should do this program, especially since someone else will help us find the funding for it. Um, so Paul really has been very instrumental in keeping this program going. And we want to, I personally want to offer my thanks to him. And um, tell him he shouldn't be embarrassed because it's a wonderful thing that you've done. So on behalf of the National Committee, I just want to join Paul in thanking our sponsors, Marriott and Microsoft. We're very grateful to them for providing the means for us to go forward. And there's one more person I want to recognize before we go, who's sitting in the front row. Um, some of you who've been to this lecture before know, especially those who go way back, know that the widows of both Doe Barnett and Mike Oxenberg, Lois Oxenberg and Jean Barnett, attended the first few lectures, and then after Lois unfortunately died, Jean Barnett continued to come. Jean is now 88, and unfortunately, as much as she would have loved to have been here, could not make the trip. But I talked to her on Sunday, and she was very excited that it's still going on. 
and asked me to please send her regards to everybody here. So I do send those, but you can also get them even more first-handed because Doak's nephew, James Garnett, who James, you just want to raise your hand to stand up or whatever. So <laughs> James continues the Barnett family's uh, love for China. James and his lived he and his wife May have lived in China for many years now and he's currently working up in Beijing at Amazon and has come down here in the last couple of years for all of the lectures to represent the family. So we're delighted that he can be here with us today. Um, I'm sorry that my co-chair, so Paul is the chair of the organized Barnett Oxenford Lecture Organizing Committee and Huang Ren Wei, who is the president of the, the current president of the American Association, Association of American <laughs> Scholars, sorry, the Shanghai Association of American Scholars, too many A, A's and S's for that. Um, he unfortunately couldn't be with us today. He is up in Beijing. And instead, we have a wonderful substitute for him, Nisha Shun, who is an old friend both of mine and of our speaker, Susan Thornton. And uh, Professor Ni will introduce her. And then we have another old friend uh, who is here, Tsui Li Ru, who um, I'm really delighted because Tsui is a, a very thoughtful, um, thinker about international relations in general and about U.S.-China relations specifically. And <clears throat> he, like Doak and like Mike, are very committed to um, open and forthright and honest discussions. Um, I am sort of reiterating something that Paul said in um, his closing lines, which was that communication is really important. And it's, this whole lecture series is devoted to the belief that open and forthright and honest communication between our two countries is desperately important. And we've always said that, but now in this very sort of fraught, tense situation, it's really more important than ever. So I'm really delighted that we have three wonderful people here. Paul and I are both delighted to have three wonderful people here on the, excuse me, on the podium, who are people who are known for being open and forthright and honest. And it's only through those kinds of qualities that I think the relationship has any hope for the future, because mutual understanding and mutual trust are the keys to going forward in a thoughtful way. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Lee, nee, who will uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, James. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, <coughs> the annual Burnett Oxenberg Lecture has brought all of us together today to warmly welcome to the conference and Professor Sway. It's a great pleasure and honor to have Susan as the key no speak, speaker of this year's Berlin Oxford Lecture. And also it's a great and pleasure and honor to have Professor Clay as the moderator. This year's lecture is conducted at a unique and critical moment. On the one hand, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the China-US diplomatic relations. And we all agree that we need a new start of a mutual relationship at this time. On the other hand, unfortunately, that we found that the mutual relationship between China and the United States is now on decline. With strategic mistrust with trade war escalating. So we want to know what about the future of US China relations? What is the current situation of this great important US China relationship? What are those challenges that we face? 
and what measures we should take to prevent U.S.-China relations from further being jeopardized, and what is the first path of U.S.-China relations in the years ahead. All those are our common concerns. And today, so the Shirk is going to talk about these concerns. Oh, so the, so the fountain is going to talk about those concerns. And so the, so the fountain is the former acting assistant secretary of state in charge of Asian Pacific affairs in the State Department of the United States. He's now a senior research fellow at Yale University Law School. One thing I want to add is that in June 2018, Susan was ranked among the top 10 Americans having exerted great impact on US-China policy. And the name of Henry C. Kissinger is also on the list. So <clears throat> today, I think uh, we are so you know, excited to have Solon to give keynote speech. The topic of her speech is prospects of co-evolution in China-U.S. relations. Now the floor is given to Solon, please. I'm sorry for that side of the room, but I feel that this momentous occasion requires that we have the podium and we so. Uh, thank you all very much for, for being here today. I was told this is going to be an informal event, and I want to make sure that I leave plenty of time to have a conversation with all of you. I, I'm not sure who put me on the list of the top 10 people impacting US-China relations, but I hope that we're all here today because we want to have a positive impact on U.S.-China relations. I think all of us in this room care a lot about the future of this relationship. That's why you're here. And um, I am honored to be here among a long list of my heroes, really, former Barnett Oxenberg lecture speakers. The whole list, actually, is just an incredible list of, of my heroes and people I've looked up to my whole career. Um, so I'm, I'm humbled to be here in front of you today as well. Um, I, I wanted to also just mention though, we're here because of uh, the special bonds that get created between teachers and students, between um, adventurers, travelers, scholars, business people, who travel the world to meet people from different walks of life, different cultures, um, speak different languages, and build close bonds together because they have practical cooperation that they work on, or they have curiosity about something. And those bridges, those connections, end up being the strong things that carry us through life. And you can see it on display here today with. Paul Liu setting up this forum to honor two people who were very, very influential in his life, his teachers. And so I think it's important to sort of keep in mind that we're all real people here. Um, whether we are from the United States or from China, you know, we have long time uh, relationships that bring us together, and those are really valuable, strong currency for us, and we should hold on to that. Because today, U.S.-China relations are really caught up in this vortex of mutual insecurity and recrimination, and it's been alluded to here by several of the speakers. Daily stories we have in the newspapers now about the trade war, uh, China's predatory economic practices, the theft of intellectual property, cheating, etc. Um, the Defense Secretary of the United States, who's now acting but been nominated to be the Defense Secretary, and others have said that China is the greatest long-term threat to the United States. 
Um, the director of our Federal Bureau of Investigation has called China a whole of society threat. And a representative of the State Department not long ago said that the U.S.-China strategic rivalry would be a clash of civil nations. Um, China also believes the U.S. is threatening it by thwarting its economic rise and trying to block its modernization program. Both sides are contending with military assets in the seas near China's coast and elsewhere, daring, just daring the other side to provoke some kind of a crisis. And people in both China and Washington, D.C. are calling for technological decoupling or, or separation of the U.S. and China's economies in part or in whole. This is something seems so fantastic and unrealistic to us, but people are talking about this now. Some people say that the US and China are entering a new Cold War. This is a huge change. The US has always seen China as an opportunity, and China has certainly seen the US as the key to its modern progress. Uh, in the early days of uh, U.S. interactions with China, of course, U.S. Um, travelers focused on opening up China to the outside world. And in those days, this was done by our traders and by missionaries. Uh, in World War II, of course, China and the United States were allies fighting against the Japanese invasion of China. And the U.S. saw China as crucial to its plans for the war in Asia. The US even tried to bro broker a compromise between, uh, to end China's civil war in 1949. And George Marshall came over and tried to broker a compromise between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. Of course, he was accused after the fact of losing China, and that touched off a raft of accusations in the United States Congress by Congressman Joe McCarthy who went looking for the communist traitors who lost China. We entered a period of estrangement with, from China. And of course, Mao Zedong turned to the Soviet Union to try to help him modernize China. But when that didn't work out, luckily for US-China relations, President Nixon, who was quite visionary, and Henry Kissinger saw an opening, an opportunity to both address the lingering war in Vietnam and try to bring that to a close, but also to uh, find a new ally against sort of countering Soviet aggression at the time in China. And so those two goals were behind the kind of opening that Nixon made when he came to China in 1972. But he also spurred kind of a curiosity and a vision among Americans about China when he said, you know, we can't leave China there um, outside the community of nations forever. And I think that was the beginning of a real love affair in America with China. That visionary diplomatic normalization that took place 40 years ago was key to the following 40 years of peace in East Asia. And key frankly, to the Asian economic miracle. The rise of economies all across Asia, including China, that brought about the greatest reduction in poverty and increase in human well-being in modern times. So what is it that has changed? People keep asking me this question. What, what happened? <laughs> um, I think this is a really important question that many people have tried to answer. Uh, clearly things have changed in both China and the United States. And those changes have brought us to what many people see as a fundamental breakpoint in US-China relations. Graham Allison, a professor at Harvard University, has posited that what is new is that the US and China are falling into the Thucydides trap Graham Allison, of course, wrote a book about this, Thucydides Trap, about the US-China relationship, and the book is called 
destined for war. And it's a bestseller right now in Beijing. It's been translated into Chinese. So that's pretty ominous for us and where we stand today. Some say that changes in Beijing have led us to this point. Probably mostly Americans say that, but go with it for now. Um, I think it's clear that China has embarked on a more aggressive foreign policy and has turned away from reform and opening. Since about 2008, 2009 is when it started, just after the great financial crisis. China abandoned, of course, the economic reform program that was put forward in 2013 at the Third Plenum, turned more towards state intervention in the economy here, embarked on an aggressive island building program in the South China Sea, um, and along with this, we've seen an increase in state efforts to appropriate technology by whatever means so that China could move up the production value chain and try to escape the middle income trap, which has been a huge priority for the Chinese state. Of course, China continues to favor Chinese companies. I see a lot of business people in the audience, and I don't think that will come as a surprise to any of you. Um, market sectors that US companies and others have been, opening, have, opening, have been hoping would open up have been kept closed. And China has generally not lived up to the commitments of moving to a open market economy that were embodying its WTO accession commitments in 2001. So coincident with this was a renewed campaign of official retribution against those who would speak out or organize um, against prevailing government policies. And of course, the specter of the incarceration of an entire ethnic group based on the assumption that they harbor extremist thoughts is pretty anathema to people in the United States and I think elsewhere in the global community. Um, I think what's happening actually in Xinjiang is more significant in the deterioration of relations between the United States and China than most people in China realize. Uh, but of course things in the US have also changed. Obviously, our current president has a unique style. He likes to keep people off balance and communicates often very directly through certain social media platforms often. Um, and this, I had direct experience with this, it does make diplomacy very difficult. Um, this approach of the president reflects, I think, a, a disappointment and a fear regarding globalization and the changing international landscape among many Americans. So maybe this aspect of the Thucydides trap is, maybe Graham Allison is, is onto something here. Um, many want to blame this fear of globalization and uncertainty about the future on China, claiming that China hasn't played by the rules of the international system that it signed up to that China has undermined the US, US industrial base, cost us jobs, et cetera, and kept its markets closed. Um, and some of these claims might be exaggerated or incorrect, but there is a kernel of truth in all of them. <laughs> and that is what the current trade negotiations are about. I think that the U.S. and China should certainly get about fixing the global trading system so that it is fair and sustainable, which is in both of our interests. And I also think that the trade deal that was on the table as of a week and a half ago and now seems to have evaporated into thin air should be pursued and should be closed as quickly as possible. I think it's a good deal for U.S. business, and I think U.S. business should make clear that they think it's a good deal, and I think it's going to be a good deal for China, because China needs to move ahead on opening up its markets and moving ahead with its economic reform program. Um, and I think you need to make it clear that the two countries that benefit the most from globalization are the United States and China. 
And people who talk about rolling back globalization or think that that's going to happen um, need to face up to this reality. Um, so what, uh, what should we do? Rather than being destined for war or entering into a costly new Cold War, because I'm one of the people who lived through the Cold War, and I certainly don't think there are many people that want to go back to that. Uh, I think US interests are best served over the long term by constructive cooperation and responsible competition with China, coupled with balancing and deterrence to curb any aggression. We can compete effectively while allowing China the space to grow and expand its influence and make its own mistakes. <coughs> U.S. interests will be harmed not just by conflict with China, but we will also be hurt if we are unable to accept a more powerful China and if we fail to build constructive relations with China's active participation is going to be crucial to addressing future challenges affecting all states. And the reality is that future problems will mostly not be bilateral, but multilateral or transnational, no matter what China and the United States would prefer. So to devise a policy that would allow for more productive U.S.-China relations, I think we would need to see clearly what it is that each country, which, what each side wants, or maybe more appropriately, what each side needs. So let's do an experiment, and I would love it if people after I talk about this um, disagree or have additions or subtractions, please feel free in the dialogue to follow to let me know. Um, so I have a list of what China wants, and I have a list of what the US wants. It's not a complete list, because I only have a half an hour up here. Um, and the US list alone would probably take hours to, <laughs> to unspool. But um, my list for China goes like this. Number one, China wants stability. First and foremost, China wants domestic stability. And secondly, China wants stability in its region, on its periphery, no conflict. Number two, China wants continued growth of its national economic power, access to natural resources to power its economy, and markets for continued growth. And here I have in parentheses Belt and Road Initiative, which we can talk about later. And this, in China's view, is the win-win cooperation part of the equation. Number three, China wants international respect and recognition of the legitimacy of its governance model. Um, this is the mutual respect. Um, and it wants the ability to push back on those that are infringing its interests, in other words, not respecting it. And number four, of course, China wants consolidation of its national borders. This might go hand in hand with number one, stability, but certainly consolidation of national borders, i.e. stability in Tibet, stability in Xinjiang, uh, recovery of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea, those areas that it uh, claims. What does the US want? First, the U.S. wants to maintain global leadership while seeing increasing contributions to the global system from others. Some might think this is controversial now in the United States, but I don't really think it is. I think most Americans want the United States to maintain global leadership. Uh, number two, the United States also wants continued economic growth and dynamism for its economy. Number three, the United States wants to continue to provide a security deterrent and a security umbrella in the Asia-Pacific region to ensure stability and peace in this region. This region is going to be crucially important economically for 
America's uh, future and for the future of the rest of global prosperity and growth. And the United States wants to make sure it can have a role and it be engaged in providing security here. Number four, the United States wants respect for the rules of the game, fair play in the international system. Number five, the United States wants promotion of good governance around the world, meaning um, the spread of its values, ideally, but if it can't get that, at least avoiding the creation of failed states through bad governance. And it would not like it if other countries were spreading that kind of bad governance or um, you know, values and, and standards that were announced as good governance. Hello. Um, so, if you look through these two lists, um, it might look like there's a lot of problems <laughs> in uh, the list of wants that the U.S. has and China has, and there might be a lot of room for tension and conflict there, and I think that's right. But there's also a lot of space there for uh, overlap of common ground and working together. Um, since these interests that I've listed above are enduring, they're probably going to outlast the current administrations in both countries. These are not things that are going to be changing at some point in the future, most likely. These are, these are kind of bedrock um, values and things that the two countries are seeking. So it does provide us with a possibility of devising a longer term roadmap for what I call co-evolution that accounts for common desires and differences and tries to work those out satisfactorily somehow over time. This is the kind of effort that Henry Kissinger, who was mentioned by my friend, Professor Nisha Shion, uh, has called for when he says we need to fashion a new world order. And perhaps this is also the kind of thing that has been uh, referred to in the Chinese concept of a new model of major power relations. I don't know. But we have to try to focus on this kind of a productive, long-term shared agenda if we're going to make progress, I think, in this relationship. And so I'd like to speak to a few of the areas where I think um, we could possibly focus efforts to try to come up with a roadmap for a virtuous co-evolution cycle between the United States and China. The first most obvious area is the economy, and we've got to get this trade deal done if we're going to move forward on this one. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, Asia is the future engine of global growth, and China and the U.S. can both make tremendous gains or engender tremendous setbacks, depending on our ability to co-evolve in the international economic system. And the U.S. should continue to press China, I think, on the forms and opening, and should push the envelope here by joining the CPTPP, which is the new name for the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we tried to uh, close in the last administration. This would push high trades, high standards of trade in the trading environment, and would have the effect of a trade-induced race to the top that would provide a competition for a more abundant WTO, World Trade Order, World Trade Organization. It would also allow the U.S. and its partners to set, set modern standards for new technologies, which will be the lifeblood of future growth. And if you have a large trading block with high standards like this that comprises a lot of the economic activity in Asia, if you could link it to a trading agreement with Europe, like TTIP, then you would have a competitor to the WTO and you would also provide an incentive for China to move further towards reform and opening high standards and open trading systems. The second area is East Asian security. This one is a little bit tougher to find a co-evolution solution. Um, but for the 40 years of U.S.-China normalization, there have been no conflicts in East Asia. 
So let's just think about that. 40 years of normalization, no con no major conflicts in, in the East Asian region. I mean, that, that's incredible. States have not had to spend money on military buildups and military assets. They've been able to put their money into economic development in this region, and it shows. Um, they've been able to balance economic dependency on China with the U.S. security umbrella that has allowed them to avoid falling prey to pressure tactics. And I think this setup has proven itself and will need to continue into the future. I think China is going to have to evolve to see the value of the constraining effects of the U.S. security presence in the region. And the U.S. is going to have to evolve in respecting legitimate Chinese security concerns. This is going to be very difficult. But I think this problem is not the most prominent problem that we have in U.S.-China relations. Uh, and I think that it can be managed, and I hope that over time it would be ameliorated if we could address it in this way. And there are clearly potential areas for cooperation in East Asia between the U.S. and China, for example, on the North Korean nuclear program. So we should be able to move ahead in those productive areas as well. A third area is technology and cyber. Uh, right now, this area appears to me to be the locus of major tension and a standoff. Uh, but as two major technology innovators and users whose populations and systems are totally tied to our devices, the US and China, I think, are going to have to cooperate on many aspects of technology, including standards, regulation, emergency response, and international norms for the protection of infrastructure and arms control type agreements. Domestic governance is another area where I think we could find some fruitful cooperation. Uh, Chinese technocratic governance is improving people's satisfaction with government services in China. China has a lot of experience and innovation in managing mega cities and is using, for example, automated systems to register and resolve certain types of court cases. Imagine what this would do to the US legal industry. But a lot of people say those jobs are a lot of them going away anyway. Um, but the US has problems with some of China's governance methods. There's no question about that. And we wouldn't adopt certainly wholesale everything that's happening in this area. But many U.S. mayors and governors have had continuing contacts with local Chinese officials in these megacities, and they are finding that they also have a lot to learn and share regarding pragmatic city management and governance issues. And I think this could be an expanding area as uh, technology changes. Another area, international governance. International institutions are in need of a major overhaul. There's no secret about that. Uh, China has complained that it has not been given a say in setting up the international system or its institutions. And so I think it is high time that we try to work with China on reforming these institutions since they need changing anyway. Um, this would be an opportunity to revamp global development programs, um, fix the funding mechanisms, and modernize and repair the international trading system, and listen to China's ideas or its objections to various aspects of the UN system, and the ideas they have for reform of that system. I think this is a crucial area for future work, as both the US and China want to strengthen the international system for their own long-term interests. Some people say that China wants to overturn the international system. I, I disagree. I think the international system has served China's modernization and development very, very well. I think China understands the need for and the value of the international system. And I think uh, it would be willing to work with the United States and other countries to strengthen that system and to contribute even more to that system as it's uh, begun to do in the recent decades. 
Another area is global issues. This is my favorite, personal favorite. I mentioned that I think most of the problems of the future are going to be transnational in nature, not bilateral. Um, you know, people in the national security industrial complex in the United States have a tendency to dismiss things like health and disease, like migration, environment, non-proliferation, food and product safety, education, scientific research, transnational crime. They dismiss these things as being kind of soft or multilateral issues. But these are the things that actually people in our two countries, the average people out there, not in the capitals, these are the things that they really care about. And these are the things that profoundly affect their daily lives. Um, I think people around the world are looking to have their faith in government and institutions renewed. So US-China cooperation on something like climate change, for example, could restore some of that faith and has the potential to be planet altering. So I think this could be the, just the important kind of thing that brings people back to the realization that US-China cooperation is going to be essential for our long-term future. And I think if we don't do that, our future generations are not going to forgive us. And I think they probably are right. They should not forgive us. So thank you very much. And I look forward to having a conversation with you. Next, let, let's invite uh, the Professor Tree, please, uh, the former uh, president and the other research, senior research fellow of the, China, of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations to make the comments. Right, please. Thank you, Professor Lee. <coughs> I'm very much honored to be invited as the commentator, especially for Susan. And also, I think it's my honor uh, to be here for this uh, very meaningful and important Luxembourg uh, and the Bernard lecture. Uh, because time is limited, so I just uh, straight to my Commentary. Uh, Susan made a very, very good speech. It's very comprehensive, uh, very much objective and positive and constructive. Uh, I, generally speaking, I agree with her on these uh, descriptions of the current situation about the both China and the United States. The general views to each other. But I have to say, in nowadays, as far as I know, I have seen many people, if they want to make a speech, would like Susan to talk in such a constructive and positive views. So Susan belongs to the school of optimism. Uh, nowadays, maybe more people are belongs to the school of the present, at least uh, for the short period. Uh, now the question is, uh, we, we, we cannot avoid very, very much important the focus. And nowadays, both government uh, uh, seriously discuss the debate and on the topic of the trade war. I think the trade war reflects a very important uh, subject, both faced by the United States and China. That is, we come to a very historical uh, turning point, crossroad, a new phase of our relationship. In the, coming decades. My view is that uh, why all these changes? 
why changes has brought tensions in us, and what we can expect in the future of our relationship. We have to face that. In my view, we have come to a very historic new period. This period, uh, we will see a new configuration of sino US relations, which is very much different from the past 40, 50 years. And the fundamental changes taking place in the international arena, but also in between China and US, in our relations, and also about our mutual perceptions with each other. I think uh, among various uh, factors, variables, one of the most important things, especially for your China relation, is uh, China is uh, rising up. And from my personal perspective, observations. And uh, not many American strategists, politicians in Washington, D.C. can have that kind of more positive, objective, sober views about the present China, like she said. So this is a very much a fundamental issue we have now. To quite a number of Americans in Washington, D.C., to me, they have difficulty to accept a rising, a stronger China, which is somewhat different. Well, in some important areas, you know, important aspect, different to what they expected. They would hope China. I'm not saying that, but China, all things happen in China, everything's perfect. We have many problems. We made mistakes. Government made mistakes. Great leaders made mistakes. That are all the facts. But that's not the point. And Susan, in, his, in her speech, I think, uh, uh, give a very good narrative of the, what China wants, what the United States wants. But the different perception now have become a very prominent problem for us. From most people in China, their view is uh, many things American wants interfere in China's domestic affairs, which is not American business. But uh, in Americans' views, in the American or some Western values, they said, uh, this is some legitimate. We have to speak up. We have to link all these what have happened with our relationship. So this is uh, a big problem we have to face. Now taking the trade war as an example. When we discuss about the trade war, why trade war? China US has been discussing this, had dialogue for decades. And we have strategic in the economic dialogues in the higher level. But uh, we made little progress. One of the reasons is that uh, very different perceptions, very different arguments. And the discussions just have been going on just like this. And uh, both sides made their different arguments. The trade of war, I think, uh, now the United States uh, Two things, President Trump. One is deficit. The other one is uh, reciprocity. So 
President Trump will want to reduce the deficit in the very short term. Then, the so reciprocity. You have to be some fundamental changes in China's decision making, in China's policy, in China's uh, system. And uh, so the trade disputes become something political. The nowadays happening in the last two weeks is this something political become a predominant topic. Then it becomes extremely difficult because for both sides, when things come to the political level, and uh, as far as I know, all these conditions American raised for an agreement, at least uh, from the political point of view, it's extremely difficult to accept. It is almost asking the changes of China's political system. What kind of Chinese leader, Chinese government that can explain this to Chinese people? So this is the problem. So from my personal observation, I think uh, we are in a very difficult period, a transitional period. Now, Americans' argument for many people, why this change? Because China has changed its course. China has changed its policy. So, United States has to push back, has to remedy this cause change. I do not quite agree with this kind of argument. If China is a, still a weak country, even change some course of policies, Americans would not have cared too much. So the essence is China become big and the too big. So America becomes very much sensitive to all those things happening that the United States, the people in Washington DC do not like to see. That's the problem. Now we have to handle these problems. We have to address these problems. I think uh, we have different history, different culture, different political system. And the different political system from a historical views, it is the evolution of Chinese society. Which of course is very much different from US history, US culture, US political system. But still we have uh, a lot of things in common, fundamental things in common. One of them is China adopted to build up this market economy. That's why China US become interdependent. We can carry out this economic integration and which we need, which the world economy needs. So, how much time we have? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, I think that in this period, personally, in short term, I'm not very obvious. I think uh, this difficult situation will continue for quite a while. We have to prepare for this difficult period. And, uh, what we can do and what we should do, the key word is uh, management. 
We have to manage and not let the situation inspire down too much. We are still in this uh, in the uh, downturn situation. Two weeks ago, many people are obviously if two sides can reach agreement on this trade dispute, that could lay a very important foundation for management in our relations in the next five years. Please. The essence of Sino-US relations has changed somewhat. A typical example is the U.S. national strategy published by the end of 2017 by the Trump administration. And these very, very uh, important labels put on China that is the major competitor, major challenger in the revisionist state, and actually define China as the major challenger. Major challenger, in other words, people could use different terms. But nowadays, it becomes more and more serious. It could be rival. Then it could be adversary. And also could be enemy. At the beginning, in the Maybe two or four years ago, I think the rival is the most often used. But in the recent months, what I heard from the United States, I think the real not. I think people more and more to use the address, at least for many people, which is very much different. But China-US relation is very much complex. Complicated. And some people use the term of the selective cooperation, selective competition. So even we talk about uh, adversity, we talk about the rival, I think, because our relation is very complicated, we can also use the selective terms. In some areas, uh, at least the United States regard China as an adversary in some strategic levels, areas, in economic, no, in some high tech technologies. U.S. take a very much big measure. Even talk about uh, what Susan said about the Disengagement, delinkage, that is something in the Cold War used. So when you use that kind of policy in terms, China is uh, taken regarded as interest. But in some other areas, I think China is uh, rival. But uh, China is a major Right, major challenger competitor, which is very much different from what we call the competitor in general terms. But still, we are partners. And in most areas, we are stakeholders. So, this is our relationship. But it's not certain. The future is uncertain. Is we could be drifting in a very bad direction. If this trade war going on, if we can't find a, a compromise, a solution, it could possibly drift in to an all round adversity. But 
I'm somewhat hopeful that we can manage to avoid that possibility. Maybe because China and the United States are big countries. I think rationalism should be something in the genes of the big countries. If big countries cannot be rational, cannot be reasonable, and the world will be chaos. I have been in this area for about more than 40 years. So I'm very happy to hear what Susan has talked about this topic. Mainly because uh, on both sides, still a lot of people have these long-term obvious views based on the realism, based on the rationality, of course, based on being hopeful of our relationship. So I'm still hopeful in the long-term view. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. We do want to have a dialogue. Um, I will begin calling on people. There are microphones in the audience. Um, when you stand, please stand up and give us your name and where you're from before you ask your question. Uh, I'm Jean-Marc Blanchard. I'm from the Wang MIT Center and also East China Normal University here in Shanghai. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thornton, for speaking with us today. I have two non-trade war related questions for you. Uh, one is you mentioned Open Road. I'm wondering what you think would be a good American policy uh, towards China's initiative. And the second one is uh, for a long-term policy, you need long-term thinking and long-term behavior. And given the American Congress, could this really happen? Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Um, I am optimistic and hopeful. So uh, on the US Congress, it's hard to sometimes uh, be uh, hopeful and optimistic. But um, you know, I think that the US is also in transition. And there's a lot of rethinking going on. There's a new generation coming up. There are new challenges emerging. And so I'm hopeful that somehow there will be more long-term thinking. It's not in the Congress, because we can't really expect it. At least in the House of Representatives with every two years uh, being reelected, but at least on the part of the Senate and some of the you know, uh, political elites that can have more bipartisan foreign policy. I think foreign policy has to be bipartisan for it to be worth anything, so I hope that we can act on that. On the first question, Belt and Road, I think a good U.S. policy on Belt and Road would be to be uh, more. Uh, Accepting, less skeptical, more involved with the Belt and Road in order to try to help China um, bring up the standards or correct the pitfalls that we've been concerned about, uh, to try to help them make it more successful and to try to get U.S. companies more involved in the projects in the Belt and Road uh, you know, investments that are happening. I think. There's been a lot of careless, maybe, criticism of uh, the Belt and Road, not very well informed, frankly. And I think a lot of the investments that China has made in Belt and Road um, you know, probably have run into some trouble or haven't worked out as well as they wanted, but some of them are working out quite well. And so it's a mixed picture. I don't see the Belt and Road as a, some kind of a strategic threat to the United States. And I helpful for other countries to be more involved in trying to make it a positive thing for infrastructure development in this region, which will help grow the region and, and bring down to our positive benefit. Before taking another question, I was remiss in jumping to the questions too quickly without thanking Tsui Li Wu. We've known each other for a very long time, and he was a young staff member, the Y-Bond at, at Kicker, 
Uh, but it's always a pleasure to hear him speak because he is so thoughtful and, as I said before, honest and, and not afraid to say things that he thinks and believes. So I want to thank you for that very interesting response to Susan and just say that the questions don't have to be just for Susan. You can also ask questions to Sway Liu as well or Professor Ni, nee, who is very um, thoughtful in terms of the relationship. So, more questions um, to the audience. Should be Sean. Sean. And we also want to hear from the students. There are students in the audience. We want to hear not just what folks of Sean's age think, but what the younger generation thinks as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go right in. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sway. Uh, I'm Sean Sway. He's being very modest. He is the Consul General for the United States and doing a wonderful job, so thank you. Uh, one thing I appreciated in the presentation too is that you laid out a positive vision for the you know, Sean, I don't think you'd like to. Sorry. Okay, can you read that, please? Yes. Um, so, thank you, Professor Swain. Thank you, Susan. One of the things that I appreciated in Susan's presentation was you presented a positive vision for U.S. China relations based on cooperation. And you listed a number of areas where you thought there was potential to work together on global issues, to trade, economics, to global governance. And, Professor Swain, you identified areas where you think conflict has entered into the relationship. And it made me think about a period uh, not so long ago when uh, we had the Senate on Summit, where we had a very high level dialogue between two countries, where we talked about how do we set a positive vision for the two countries to work together, how do we maximize cooperation, and how do we minimize and contain differences. And so what I'm wondering is, based on that period, are there things that we can learn from either the successes or the failures of that approach to the relationship that can help us work through where we're at? I mean, there are no doubt lessons, I think, um, all along the trail of U.S. China diplomacy that we have either forgotten or are not paying attention to now. And um, so Sunny Lands is a good example where uh, one of the lessons is that you have to have good communication and frequent interactions between high level leaders in the United States and China. And you have to have leaders that send out coherent policy messages on what the approach to U.S.-China relations will be. Because in the absence of that, what you get in big bureaucracies like in China and like in the United States, there's not a clear framing for the policy and for the relationship. People freelance. And you get kind of a uh, sort of hunting season on, on the other country don't get coordinated policy, there's no clear overarching aim and goal, and you can't get anything done because it's a cycle of sort of mutual mistrust and coordination. So I think in the Sunny Land Summit, what the two leaders tried to do was set that framework for the overarching part of the relationship. And they didn't manage to do that because the Chinese side suggested this new model of major country relations, which was not either by countries in the region or some parts of it by the United States. So I think this issue of mutual suspicion about what the other side is trying to sneak in behind a slogan or a, uh, a framing concept has been a real problem. And without that framing concept, they have a problem with the implementation. But I think we've learned a lot of other lessons along the way. We need to have continuous conversations about a whole range of topics. Professor Clayton and Lou mentioned that we have a lot of dialogues that haven't produced a lot of results. That's a big problem on the U.S. side. This, this administration introduced the concept of adults-oriented into, the, into the, their description of what they want from the U.S.-China relationship. 
Um, but I think that's again it's a cultural misunderstanding about what that means, how many results, in what period of time, and how do we implement and enforce them. It becomes very um, oppositional as opposed to the partnership that Professor Tway described. But I think working toward a partnership is what we should be doing, but we've had a lot of trouble on that road. Thank you for your questions. I, I think that aside uh, what Susan said, uh, another factor is uh, as the domestic political factors have been very much influential to the foreign policy in And uh, uh, it's easier for me to take the United States as an example. And uh, I think uh, we see the policy makers has been shifted from some kind of our uh, uh, realism to the hardline politics. And uh, uh, these cabinet members are occupied uh, by these uh, 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 right wing conservative persons. So they have a very different view uh, about this relationship. And uh, I, I think uh, also these uh, President Trump's domestic agenda have very much driving forward what he would like uh, the counterpart in other countries. To do. And uh, this is a very new situation. And uh, I think China, in the beginning, means that some officials and, and the leaders didn't quite uh, understand this kind of new situation. And also, the thinking, the logic of President Trump. So, uh, although we have some uh, uh, good period at the very beginning between the two governments, the top leaders, but then we see uh, very different uh, thinkings and objectives, agendas, uh, and, and the driving force behind and make the situation become more and more difficult. So again, this is also a, a different perception with each other, and we have to have some time for both sides to and be used to these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because he limited uh, our district, our conflict only in an uh, economic aspect uh, somehow, but if uh, we are going to have another democratic president, uh, the conflict will be in full scale. Uh, so what's your opinion? Um, should we ex uh, expect another president or we, we should count down President Trump to fix our relationship? Thank you. There are people who say that, um, you know, the, the one issue in Washington, D.C. on which there is a bipartisan consensus is the get tough on China policy. So not only, um, you know, the administration, Republican administration, but also <clears throat> all of the Democrats in Congress are fully on board with President Trump's new hardline policy on China. I mean, I tend to think that it is not uh, a good idea to have all of the US-China eggs in the economic basket. I don't think it's balanced, and I don't think it's um, managing properly the differences between our two countries in a way that's sustainable and can try to minimize the differences and make progress. So basically just being ignored and festering a lot of the problems that, that Professor Tsui alluded to while we talk about the trade and economic issues. We used to have a lot of robust communication and conversations between the two governments. That's all stopped now. We're only talking about trade. It's a very high-level channel. 
between the miscommunication on all kinds of other issues and at all kinds of lower levels is just magnifying um, because there's no no communication happening. Uh, I think you know the question of China is always asking itself which U.S. president is going to be better for China, and I think that's probably not the right question to ask because it depends on you know, what the situation is and what they do about U.S.-China relations when they come in. Uh, the problem the Democrats have, of course, is that they always are going to be accused by Republicans of being weak, so they have to look tough, and that's a problem for them on China policy. Um, but I think that, you know, President Trump has a very unique style, so any other president coming into office in the United States is going to have not that unique style and a more kind of, I think, balanced and, and sort of predictable uh, set of policies toward China. So I would expect that, you know, uh, this obsessive kind of focus on trade deficits and reciprocity would, would morph into something that's a lot more familiar from past presidential administrations in the U.S. That's, that would be my guess. Thank you. Uh, I don't think uh, the China-U.S. relations will totally depend on U.S. president. Uh, Trump played a big role here. But uh, uh, what Trump educated, what Trump demanded, uh, in some extent, uh, reflect uh, some kind of um, view of sometimes uh, a view of many people in Washington, D.C. The difference is uh, the Washington, D.C. view the majority of people in these political and strategic circles is not completely representing the other part of the United States not representing views totally in the different states. So if you go to different parts of the states, you could have some different uh, observations uh, from the, what you could have in Washington, D.C. But anyway, the president makes the final decisions, so this is important. And uh, China's policy in the U.S.-China relations should not uh, uh, depend on uh, our prediction on who is going to be elected or re-elected. I think we have to realize that this is a, a huge transition. We have to realize uh, what is, just like Susan described, the huge changes take place uh, because of this transition, and uh, we just should address this changes. But one of the important things we should realize is we have to understand each other better than we used to. Uh, I think uh, this is a very much a challenging issue. And uh, I have talked with Americans, uh, also my Chinese colleagues, just for very simple argument uh, or simple phenomenon. People could have very different views on that. When China and the United States become closer, we have intertwined relations. These kind of different views could have a huge impact on the policy making process. And, and the people have very firmly believed what they believe is the truth. So this is the challenge we have to address. Right there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm also a student from Penn University. My question is on Taiwan. Um, uh, very recently, there was a bipartisan move in the Congress uh, passed a few acts on the relations between Taiwan and the United States. And my curiosity is that what is the agenda behind the Congress of Washington uh, in terms of provoking China on the Taiwan issues? Uh, well, maybe you may say that the American regime uh, has a separation of power, that the Congress is autonomous from the White House in 
terms of the foreign policy, but it seems the current administration has been less willing to interfere with uh, Congress rules on Taiwan issues. So uh, I'm looking forward to your comments on the agenda behind the, the current Taiwan policy of the current administration and uh, Congress. And does uh, uh, Washington DC concern that such uh, provoking strategy on Taiwan issues would eventually accelerate the growing Chinese suicide Reunification with Thailand partners. Thank you. Well, I certainly hope not. <laughs> um, so, ever since Jimmy Carter sent his uh, national security advisor over to negotiate the normalization communique without, in secret without telling Congress, Congress has seen, taken it upon itself to be the protector of Taiwan. So this is not a new phenomenon, but it is true that there is more kind of anti-China legislation, not just about Taiwan, but other things being produced in Congress these days than we've seen in quite a long time. Um, and I think this comes to some extent from this hunting season phenomenon that I mentioned. There's very little signal being sent from the from the top on what you know the overarching policy for uh, China from the United States administration is, and so I think this is a, you know an easy way for people in Congress to kind of uh, push forward a politically advantageous issue uh, without you know expectation of any kind of roadblocks from the administration. That said, I don't think any of the resolutions or things that have come out recently fundamentally change anything about US policy. And the administration has said that there is no change in its Taiwan policy. So in a way, it doesn't really matter what Congress puts out because it's the administration that determines what's going to happen uh, on Taiwan policy. So I think from where I sit, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a congressional reaching, overreaching on this issue, uh, but I don't expect to have it produce any major changes. And I think this is one area where the administration and President Trump himself, I know, has de declared that the policy will not change, that he's not interested in, in any changes to the status quo on Taiwan, and he very much wants to encourage Beijing and Taiwan also to maintain the status quo as it is currently set. So um, I know that these pieces of legislation get a lot of attention in China. They get almost no attention in the United States. That is, a, that is actually a constant theme throughout a lot of the China-related um, statements and things that are put out in Washington. I mean, they're aimed at a domestic audience. They get very little domestic attention. They get a lot of attention in China, which is unfortunate. Uh, but um, I think this fits in that category, and I, I actually think that the Taiwan issue is one that, among all the problems we have right now, it, it has not been a major um, point of contention or confrontation between the U.S. and China um, recently. So I, I hope we can maintain that kind of uh, steady approach to the situation. Question? Um, <laughs> wait, 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 one second. Just, just a, a couple of words. After. I, I think that this is a very important uh, question. And uh, personally, I'm very much concerned uh, by this development. At the first, it's a reflect very different atmosphere in the Washington DC in the Congress. And uh, so if you go to Washington DC with the Congress, and not many people, uh, in the public uh, arenas, saying positive words on China. So this is uh, uh, the situation, the background. The second, uh, 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 these uh, uh, resolutions builds a task that uh, put there could be something left. In. And uh, uh, whenever the president, uh, the administration would like to apply 
what has in the Congress that should be a problem, serious problems. And uh, for example, if this trade war goes on, if all our economic trade relations is going to some kind of confront, confrontational, and someone would like to educate to use in Taiwan cars, and the Taiwan issue is uh, is a foundation in political terms of our relations between two countries. So at least uh, uh, I I hope what Susan said uh, it becomes a, a, a true uh, policy of the U.S. administration. But uh, there are of course some uncertainties there. Wayne Lewis, professor at Purdue University, associated with the audience. Uh, I have a question from Ms. Sword. I'm, I'm kind of confused. It seems that you, your, your notion of co-evolution is um, out of alignment with the way in which in the U.S. and our foreign policy context we now think about China. Because the notion about co-evolution implies some parity in which two groups are equal. And so the, it seems that the present conception is, is that China has derived has been at the expense in many ways of the U.S. And so I don't quite see why your coalition notion can prevail. It seems like the rivalry or the competition is a much more prevalent way in the foreign policy conception of the United States and Washington. So my question is, why are you still kind of articulating this from your past experience in the State Department? Or how do you go? Do you see yourself as an outlier? Yeah, I think you could say I fundamentally disagree with the policy coming out of Washington, so that's probably the right, right answer. I don't understand what we're going to accomplish by this current path that we're on. I think it's destructive to U.S. interests principally, but probably also to other countries' interests, but mainly to our own interests. So. Is there a question from a woman in there? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan and Mr. Tree for coming just comprehensive speech. I'm General Virginia from SES Pudong. So our school has more than 100 years of history in Shanghai, and this has been a really important pathway to integrating the U.S. citizen in China. And seeing this future of the trade war is still unpredictable, do you think that the escalating of trade war will lead this particular American institution, starting South School, to have any possible stake in the current age of snow U.S. tension? And what are the possible challenges that we would anticipate, and who are the major stakeholders that can possibly Resolve all these challenges. Thank you. I'm sorry, can you um, say that again? Make it a little slower and, and don't have the microphone right up to your mouth because it was hard to, I should have interrupted you to tell you that. It was hard to hear you. Okay, thank you. So, um, our school has more than 100 years of history in Shanghai, and this has been a really important pathway to integrate the US citizens in, in China. And seeing that the future of the trade war is still unpredictable, means that it might have a lot of um, unpredictable things going to happen. So do you think that the escalating of trade war will lead this particular American institution, such as our school, to have any possible state and in the current age of China US tension? And what are the possible challenges that we as our school will anticipate? And who are the major stakeholders that can possibly resolve this challenge? And can you tell us, you're the Shanghai American School, is that where you're from? Yes, from okay. Canada. And you want to understand what effect the trade war will have on institutions like your school that are trying to bring Chinese and Americans together? Yes. And what you might do as institutions to help make better relations? Is that your question? Yeah. Yes. Questions? Well, I'm hopeful that the trade war is not going to have um, any major negative impact on institutions such as the Shanghai American School or other universities and educational institutions. I mean, I think um, maybe Professor Tui and I, even though he said he's hopeful as the end of his talk, his talk didn't sound too hopeful to me. <laughs> but um, I am hopeful at least that we will get to a resolution of this trade dispute. I mean, a trade dispute between the U.S. and China is not going to end with this trade deal. The U.S. and China are the two largest economies on the planet. They're two different systems, and we have a lot of complicated and intertwined business and economic interactions. 
this is a never ending trade negotiation. I hate to break it to all of you out there. But if we get a deal that um, is a good deal for you know US companies and also helps move China's reforms along, I think that's a win win and that's something we can focus on and implement and move forward. And so I hope we'll get that in the next month. But it could be longer, but I think we'll get it eventually. And I think in the meantime, people in institutions like yours and students can write letters to President Xi and President Trump and encourage them to move in the direction of a trade deal because it's going to be good for both countries and both peoples and for growth around the globe. So that would be my suggestion. OK, so I'm going to Thank you. And uh, uh, I, first, I, uh, my view is that uh, uh, your institute will not be affected easily unless our relations become very, very bad. In, in the relatively bad situation, I think uh, you will be okay. <laughs> so uh, that's first. And uh, secondly, about trade war, I think. Uh, uh, I'm not that kind of optimistic in that your view. I don't think uh, uh, we have already passed that possibility that uh, we can reach a comprehensive framework uh, or solve all these problems as a framework as a base for our trade class relations in the future. Because uh, uh, it is not a balanced uh, discussion. In Chinese uh, terms, is, uh, what the United States asked is uh, China to uh, change the uh, agreement and the coalition. I, I don't think uh, politically Chinese government can accept that. But I think uh, President Trump will stay on that. So the problem is how to find uh, something in the middle of the transition period and uh, hopefully. There's one more question. I'm very glad that all these questions have been from the younger generation. And I hope you're also are you with the American School as well? Yes. Okay, please. And this will be the last question. So. Uh, hello, my name is Andrew Sophia. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm a freshman at Shanghai American School. And as a future um, generation, I think a lot of my concern, a lot of our concern is um, artificial intelligence and bioengineering. So I, I was wondering, um, to, in order to move into the 21st century, and with the rise of concern of bioengineering and artificial intelligence, um, what should China and the US work together in order to um, immediate the consequences and um, establish a, a better 21st century? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad that you're worried about those things because I'm really worried about them too. Um, and I think this is a clear area where we don't know what the future is going to bring. The technology is already running ahead of the of government's ability to regulate it um, and government's ability to even know what's happening. And so I think you know we're filled with a lot of mutual suspicion on all of these technology issues now, which has prevented us from getting together in you know, international fora to talk about ways in which governments should be trying to exert some kind of regulatory control or at least uh, awareness and transparency over what's happening in these areas. Um, and so that would be one of my areas for co-evolution, and it's actually way beyond time to, to start having those conversations, but unfortunately, we haven't been having them for the last couple of years. I think China might be having them in international institutions with the U.S. chair sitting empty, and I think that's quite unfortunate. There is, however, in the private sector, given the private sector is beginning to do some of that work. We have a dialogue that we just started, it's called the Digital, digital Economy Dialogue, that looks at some of those, but it, it's going to require that governments sit down together in addition to just the private sector. My view is this mainly depends on U.S. policies. And uh, as I said earlier, the U.S. policy is, is selective in these areas. My impression is on those areas, the U.S. has advantages and 
advanced knowledge on the theory developed the problem in China, they would like to most likely to dealing this kind of students. So at least we could have much more difficulties in what the areas you talk about. I said on that question, but we have another one on this side from the young woman. There. Yes. From Nanjing Hello. Hello. Um, and thank you very much for your comments. Uh, my name is Marissa Weiland. I am from the Hopkins Engineering Center, a uh, graduate student there. Uh, this fall, I will be introducing and all the other uh, My first question I have to, uh, my first um, is for Thornton. Um, in your speech, you touched on issues of technology um, and cybersecurity. Um, you also touched on the issue of cyber arms control. Um, and I'm curious to know, given the divergent uh, views on issues of cybersecurity, what, in your opinion, are the prospects and some of the challenges for cooperation in this area. Um, and then my second question is for either Professor Tway or Professor Yu. Um, as a student of the Federation, um, someone who wants to see the, uh, the future of the U.S.-China relationship improve, uh, what is perhaps one piece of advice that you would give to the new generation of budding scholars and policymakers from the U.S. side? Um, so I'm also a science grad, not a Hopkins and Jane grad, but um, another salute going out to Will Barnett, who was a science teacher for many, many years, and thank you so much, James, for being with us today. Um, a lot of science graduates probably around the room, so we appreciate our institution. Uh, so technology and cyber. Um, I have been involved in a lot of conversations with China Chinese counterparts when I was in the government on cyber issues. I've done a lot of looking into this question since I left government. Yeah, my impression is that this is gonna be very hard. Um, first of all, I don't think many people have grappled with much reality about cyber security. I think we're still trying to figure out uh, a lot of things about where the belly button is on cyber security. People are not really grappling with cost-benefit analysis on cybersecurity, how, how much security is enough, how much we're willing to pay for a perfect security. And then you've got the whole intelligence angle on cyber in which nobody wants to really agree to anything or be limited in any way on what they might do in that space. So I think it's very broad. I don't know if we'll be able to get to any kind of reasonable conversations about it. It hasn't really started yet. We had some conversations about trying to define what is critical infrastructure in the case of a cyber attack, and we haven't even gotten, been able to, I mean, once you start defining critical infrastructure for a cyber attack, actually on both sides, the definition just keeps going out until you've got almost everything covered, and that keeps happening on almost all of these areas. Um, what what is a narrowly targeted set? You can never get to that narrowly targeted set. Right now, people on technology are talking about a small yard and a high fence, but nobody can decide what this, what's in the small yard. I mean, almost every technology now is dual use, and it's all considered sensitive by somebody in the, in, in the uh, either intelligence or national security community. So, these conversations aren't even really happening right now because people are not being very realistic. And until we get more realistic about you know, what it is we want to see and how we're going to have a conversation about it with other people, um, we're not getting very far, unfortunately. You can answer that question. You can answer her question. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, one suggestion, I think. Uh, uh, I, I hope the young generation to study in China and at least uh, uh, possibly could be more comprehensive. And uh, because we have more and more people in this, this 
studying Chinese, but uh, become more and more satisfied. And uh, people like uh, Doug Bernard, Michael Oxenberg, and then even the Professor Lampton, and these, they are more comprehensive. And our relations, uh, if we want to know the other side better, you have to be relatively comprehensive, you can understand complicated relations. Thank you. Excellent suggestion, and actually the National Committee has a program to get our younger China specialists, more like Bill Barnett and Mike Oxenberg and Mike Lampton, to have them look at China more comprehensively rather than through their own narrow prism of their own studies. So we hope, Mr. that you will turn out to be a comprehensive scholar as the students from the American, uh, the, the Shanghai American School. So um, I just want to thank you all before turning it over to Professor Nee, so on behalf of Paul, who can't say anything, and the National Committee. Um, we thank you very much for this. It's again been a wonderful, um, a, we have a wonderful speaker and wonderful commenter, and thank you all very much for coming. And now, Professor Nee will. <coughs> thank you very much, Chair. Uh, did you notice, is an not Jane used the word excellent? So I think that today's lecture reach the E, the excellent standard. The keynote speech, excellent. Comments are excellent. And questions and answers, excellent. <laughs> so we reach the three E standards. And I would like to use the three F to make a very brief summary. The first F is faction. And today is the keynote speaker and moderator, they build up their views on facts. They elaborate the situation of the China relations, the problems we're facing, and even the future of our mutual relationship based on facts. The factor, I think, is the one, the first characteristic, characteristics of today's election. And the second F is a friend. So look, uh, Sudan and Chai appear very frank in voicing their views. <coughs> I appreciate your, uh, what the United States want, what China wants framework. But when you listen, what China wants, you listen to the core. And what the United States want, you listen to the five. I see the next time. And the one, and the one, what China wants. So to balance, you know, to it, to it. five to five. This is my suggestion. And the third F is a fruitful. And today we really benefit from your speech, your comments, and questions and answers. Uh, particularly, we are so much you know, excited by the positive positive messages that you both send to us and through us to our friends and colleagues. And what Sudan said today reminded me what Sudan spoke at the conference that our center, Shanghai Sushum Center for International Relations held in October last year. Here I would like to quote two paragraphs of what Susan said. Susan said, the, re the, record, the record of the last 40 years of US-China relations gives us much hope. Hope. And she also said, quote, it is not an exaggeration to say that this relationship is the most consequential relationship for the future of our planet and for our children. Future peace, stability, and prosperity depends on our sustainable ability to navigate our differences and find more common ground. So last night, last night I reread 
what you said last year. But here I would like to introduce you. The children are always you know, optimistic. How should you be optimistic, right? So thank you, Susan, and thank you, Trey, very much. And thank you all. Very much. There is now a reception outside. We as girls and some of our speakers will be out there to mingle with you. Also, if you have friends who are not able to attend this, um, I'm not sure what the Shanghai Association of American Studies is going to be doing, but we will be putting this entire program on our website. So if you have friends who did not see it and you want them to be able to enjoy this excellent and frank and fruitful and factual discussion, um, you can have them go on our website and they can see it.